evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to finally come to Brisbane and lecture here. A few years ago, I was supposed to come. There was some hustle. I didn't come. So at last, I'm, I'm here, and I'm very pleased to talk to you about this, what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Uh, this is about wireless radiation and uh, how this radiation may affect our health. So this talk will be something about science, something about public health policy, and something about common sense. So very briefly, I was already introduced, so, but just briefly, I spent 22 years as Radiation Nuclear Safety Authority in Finland. This is equivalent of our PANSA here in, in Australia. I had also professorships at different universities, including Swinburne University a few years back. And I have some expert experience, and that's why I'm thinking about myself as an expert, because others consider me as an expert. So I've been advising different governments concerning this effects of cell phone radiation and wireless radiation on, on human health. In 20, 2011, there was International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is agency of this World Health Organization, arranged evaluation of all knowledge concerning carcinogenicity of cell phone radiation and invited 30 experts to Lyon to discuss this issue and make decision what's, what's up. I was one of those 30 experts. So this is something what Donald Rumsfeld, sorry, Donald Rumsfeld said some time ago in 2002. It was a matter of many, many jokes, but still when reading this very carefully, you can understand that it is very sensible thing, what he said. So there are things that we know that we know. It's obvious. But there are also things that we know that we don't know. So something we know that we didn't study, didn't examine. So we know that there might be something, but we didn't examine it. But then finally, there are things that we don't even know that we don't know. So there are those three different types of our knowledge, what we know, what we don't know, and what we don't know that we don't know. And some of this is being used by us in formulating, for example, policies in, in health, uh, human health and EMF. So policies concerning human health and EMF are mainly based on this what we know. There are issues that we don't know, and we know that those things we didn't study, but we avoid them. We don't use them for setting health policies, even though that we know that we didn't study certain topics, and therefore it is difficult to make final decision. But still, we don't use these this, uh, uh, issues. And of course, anything that could lead to implementation of any kind of precautionary approach, and this is part of this what we don't know, is, is considered as scaremongering. So our problem is that we have very rapidly developing uh, wireless technology, that human health research as always with any technology is lagging far behind these developments. And this development of this technology and implementation is based on this that we assume that there is no health risk. But this assumed health of risk appears not to be correct, that something false is there. Because biomedical research over the last, since early 80s, shows that there might be some health hazard. And but this existence of health hazard is very selectively accepted or denied depending with whom you are talking about. 
And we have the same scenario repeating over and over again that we are not learning from past experiences. We know something, something might be affecting our health, but on the other hand, this is so wonderful, this new technology, so let's go ahead and listen to engineers who are saying no problem, no worries whatsoever. We can begin with what World Health Organization says our health is, and they have very broad definition of health. For them, health is not only this that we don't have any disease, but also status of our mental health and also our well-being, social well-being. Therefore, if extending and thinking really carefully from this definition, anybody who is worried about this radiation emitted by cell phones, Wi-Fi, and so on, who is worried and concerned, is not feeling well about it, has a health effect. <coughs> cell phones were not tested for health hazard before they were put on market. So this is first thing, that it was military technology from US, which was decided to be put for commercial use in civil, civilian markets. And Food and Drug Administration in US decided to let it happen without any testing, because this equipment has very low power that it's emitting. So meaning low power radiation is being emitted. Therefore, it was assumed that it will be harmless. So that was in early 80s when this became. And 30 years later, in 2011, International Agency for Research on Cancer decided it is not really so that it is possibly carcinogenic to humans. We don't have final proof. We don't have ultimate proof to say, yes, this is a carcinogen. But there is a possibility. So meaning there is enough scientific evidence to doubt that it is completely uh, um, inert, that we don't have any impact of this. So this assumed lack of health effect, which we assumed in early 80s, that there is no any, it is appearing to be false. This research on cell phone radiation or this wireless radiation is very limited. You often can hear statements and saying that $12 billion have been spent on this type of research examining wireless radiation, that there are tens of thousands of articles published. But when you start looking at those tens of thousands of papers and you go to specialized database that is collecting all information, how much you find of research that has been done specifically on the radiation that is emitted by cell phones or wireless devices that we are using. Well, as of August 3rd, there were only 262 studies which we call epidemiological on people, and other studies, this kind of human, animal, laboratory in vitro studies, 1,138. This is all what has been done, research on this radiation. One can think, well, there are many studies, but majority of them is useless for estimating human health risk. They might be interesting for, majority of them, for example, this 1,138, there were laboratory studies done on different cell cultures. Different types of cells were grown in laboratory, exposed and analyzed, and those studies, while may provide information about mechanism for health risk estimate and setting up human health policies, they are nearly useless. So there is not so much of this research. And there are, of course, limitations of this research. So very many studies, as I said, are useless for human health hazard estimation. We have a lack, and this is very surprising, we have a lack of studies that would examine how this radiation affects human physiology. That we take people, expose them to this low level radiation, take samples from people, blood, saliva, urine, whatever you can sample without harming person, what can you do ethically, and analyze it before exposure, after exposure, 
what kind of changes are happening. We don't have such a studies. If you think really carefully and you read the, this database, this many fingers is more than those studies that have been done really on humans. All our information is based either on epidemiology, which is very indirect information, or some animal studies or in vitro studies. Then we have a lack of studies on chronic exposure. Most of those studies that are published are such that some, something animal or human or, or cell was exposed, few hours later or maybe a couple of days later was analyzed, effect or no effect, whatever. But there are no really, except for some animal studies, no studies where we could think that human being is getting cell phone when goes to school, it is about six years old, and then will use this cell phone for another 80 years. Will this radiation have any effect or not? Meaning we are very resilient as, as um, our physiology and we can adjust to different circumstances. Will we adjust to this small level of radiation or not? We don't know. We don't have studies on this. And of course, there is a problem that also very many studies have relatively low scientific standard. They are not very good studies, not very well done. Sometimes this radiation exposure <coughs> is not done very well. Therefore, from this really well less 2,000 studies, majority is really, really useless. We don't have much information. Then, of course, every now and then, <coughs> one can ask, do we have consensus that something is happening or not, there is no any problem? And when you hear WHO, listen to WHO, or International <coughs> uh, Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, if you listen to them, then there is consensus, everything, everybody <coughs> agrees that there is no problem. But this is not consensus, really. This is what Emily van de Venter said <coughs> about consensus a couple of years ago. And she herself, she's heading WHO um, project that is responsible for uh, spreading information on health risks from cell phone radiation. And as she says, that data is gray. It is not black or white. We don't really know for sure something. And there is no consensus. Then further, she of course, uh, it mentions that there is little group and small, uh, large group. Nobody examined ever this to ask all scientists what they think. Majority of scientists don't want to admit what they think. They don't want to be labeled. And we have a problem with evaluation of science. We have different types of groups of scientists who are evaluating science for different purposes, for governments, for WHO, for different organizations. And there is a one major problem. If you collect team of scientists, but they have the same opinion, they think that this is having effect or having no effect, then if within this kind of closed group of guys or, or scientists, ladies and gentlemen, who have the same opinion, who will be this devil's advocate and who will fight for this opposing view? Then, when they agree on something, well, no, okay, we can discuss this, but, well, we agree on this, that there is no any effect. So those discussions are sort of pretending to evaluate everything without any bias. They have scientific bias because they all think that there is effect or there is no effect. They are not, they are not group, not good evaluations. They are biased. And for example, <coughs> there are those groups like, sorry, uh, uh, like International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, or CENIS, this is a commission from, from European Union, or, or IEEE from, from US, they think that there is no effect. They are, but those, when you look at those people who are members of those committees, they are known for this, that they think that there is no effect. But then you have another group that are saying that, yes, certainly there is effect. But if you look at 
composition of those different groups. There also you see, yep, they are scientists who have the same opinion that there is some effect. So those are really biased evaluation. There was exception, and I was happy to be part of it, in 2011 at IARC. Because scientists who were collected by IARC, I don't know for what reason, I don't know how they made this, their selection, but it was really a mix of those who think, yes, there is effect, no, there is no effect, and some of those who are ambivalent, yeah, maybe yes, maybe not. But those <coughs> were real discussions, long discussions and fighting for it. And what happened at the end, that out of these 30 scientists, 27 voted it is possible carcinogen, even though the split between those who think that this is uh, causing some effect versus not causing, majority was who a priori, before the meeting, thought that there is no any effect. So we have this problem, problem of bias in evaluation of science, and then we are being fed information from one side or another, and they are saying this is consensus, this is no consensus, but this evaluation is really biased. If we are thinking about health effect, this is what is most studied, is brain cancer. And epidemiology studies, this case control studies, that you select group of people who have cancer, select group of people who don't have cancer, check their habits of using cell phones, and compare them. So these epidemiology case control studies, they are indicating that there is, thank you very much, that there is uh, brain cancer risk. Uh, this evaluation in 2011, what I spoke about this at IARC, uh, has been based on this decision that this is possible carcinogen, was based mainly on two studies, one large interphone European study and two series of studies from Sweden by Leonard Harder and his co-workers. They were based. But then, a couple of years later, in France was published similar study, exactly the same way done by Interpol and Hardell, so-called Serenat study, which arrived at the same kind of results as Hardell and Interpol, confirmed these studies. So now we have three case control studies that are showing the same effect. There is increase in the risk of developing brain cancer glioma, which is really bad brain cancer. And of course, there is, in this epidemiological study, you can wonder sometimes, st scientists publish study, then, you, then they say that regular use of cell phone doesn't cause any problem, health problem. And you think every day, regular use. I, I, regular, I am a regular user of cell phone, I sometimes use it. And that's not science. Science says regular user, as they define it in those studies, is a person who makes one phone call per week for six months. That's all. <laughs> if you do this much of calling, you have no problem whatsoever. By this definition, you can be a regular smoker, smoke this much cigarettes as you get, no, no lung cancer at all. So this is this kind of ridiculous definitions. What they are, they are trying to define some things but end up with kind of ridicul ridiculous definition. But those who are getting brain risk, increased risk of brain cancer are so-called avid users. And those avid users were then, that was 20 something years ago defined, they are persons who are using cell phone for half an hour every day for 10 years or longer. So that was long time ago, half a, an hour per day it was considered a very long time. Now many people use much, much longer. But when somebody who has been this kind of avid user, in these studies was Interphone was saying that there is 40% increase in developing brain cancer. Cardell studies were showing 170%, and Serenat studies said that there is 100% increase in developing, uh, increase in risk of developing brain cancer. And later on, last year, 
Interphone published study where they were trying to correlate location of brain cancer in brain with the most exposed area to cell phone radiation. So they were asking people how you use your cell phone to, on the right side or left side, more on this, more on that. And this way, with some bias for, for recall what people remember, they found in the end that there is correlation that the more exposed area of brain, there develops brain cancer. But all these studies, those three sets of studies, they all underestimate risk. So this risk might be higher than this percentage you said here, because they don't have at all any information about radiation exposure. They use surrogates for radiation exposure. And how it happens? They use surrogates, this kind of, that they, are, they use minutes of calling. So they were asking people how many minutes per day or per week, whatever, you were using your cell phone calling. So people remembered better or worse, never mind. There was some bias also in, in recalling this. And this way, they underestimate exposure. And problem is that how you are exposed, it depends in how good field you are, reception field with your cell phone. If you are far from cell tower, your phone emits more radiation to, con to communicate with cell tower. When you are close to cell tower, your phone emits less radiation because it is easier to communicate with cell tower. Therefore, if you have two persons, one who is talking far away from cell tower and having back field, and another talking close to cell tower in good field, they will be very differently exposed. One will be, ex this one person will be exposed very much, this will be exposed very little because they phone emits less radiation. But in those studies, they both spoke for one minute. Therefore, they are analyzed in this same exposed group. So many group exposed for one minute has people highly exposed and little exposed. And they are averaging, meaning lowering this risk. There are also other epidemiology studies there, for example, there is a study from U.S. in 2012 published that is showing, sorry, okay, wrong button, uh, trend data how is increasing brain cancer in population in U.S. And they found that there is some correlation between how the small slow, uh, increase as predicts interphone, so this 40% increase, that, not, but not so much as Hardell, there is not this kind of very dramatic increase. There was another Danish cohort study. So cohorts, it is, you take huge population, few hundred thousands of people, and you follow them for years. And you look at their habits of using cell phone and what is happening to their health. So this is Danish cohort. And they published studies very soon after, after evaluation of, of carcinogenicity. But they don't have exposure of, to radiation at all. They have, their, ex, their surrogate is how long you own your cell phone. This is their, their and I, I wrote very serious criticism of this. It is available in, in the Scientist magazine. There is another study, for example, also a large million women study. Somebody got genius idea. We are doing million women study uh, in UK, uh, where we are following women of certain age, 50 or more, who are menopausal and who are getting therapy for, for menopause, some hormonal therapy. So somebody, so this was very specific group of, of, of people. And then somebody got genius idea, let's ask them how much they use their cell phones and we get information about cell phones. So what this information about radiation exposure was, have you never used or used uh, once a day or every day? 
this, this information is simply a joke if you are thinking about radiation exposure. Well, you cannot find anything with this information. Then was fi finally studied in Australia, 2016, Chapman published study. And, and I have written about this study on my blog also. And there, is some, there are some misleading claims. For example, this that 29 years of usage of cell phone in Australia didn't cause anything. But there is not 29 years of usage, really avid use, that many people used. At the beginning, this first 20 years, people were using very little, and not everyone had the cell phone. Therefore, this claim of, of 30 years nearly of, of usage, and there is no any effect seen in Australian population, doesn't work well. But then they were trying to say, OK, but what should be seen if there is really risk? So then they had done the calculations, theoretical calculations. That's OK. That's fine. But they used the latency of brain cancer, so meaning from onset that it is started, beginning, triggered, to diagnosis. So this latency, when we don't know that somebody has it because it's not diagnosed, but it's developing, they said it is 10 years. Might be, but usually, in case of brain cancer, we are thinking that there are several tens of years, 30, 40, maybe 50 years of latency before it is manifesting. Therefore, this is sort of exaggeration. This is one number. I asked Chapman specifically, what would be looking your data when you use other latency periods, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Will it be, in, sit in this situation, possible to see that some increase will be happening? He was not interested to recalculate his data. There is, of course, a huge number of, of cell phone users in population. But there is no dramatic increase in brain cancer if we are looking at statistics. If you look at statistics of brain cancer in Finland or in, in different European countries or Australia, they are, if there is some increase, it is very minuscule, more flat. But first of all, we have to remember that brain cancer is a rare disease. It is rare. It is 10 to 20 cases per 100,000 people, very few. Even if the worst predictions of these epidemiological studies would manifest, this would be still a rare disease, because instead of 10 to 20 cases, you would have some 40 to 60 cases per 100,000 people. So it is still a rare disease. Not everyone will get it. Brain cancer latency is tens of years, so there can be that this 20 or 30 years ago when we began to use, we don't know how much of usage of cell phone radiation is needed before this process of getting developing brain cancer is triggered. So there might be still years to come when something may manifest more. Then, of course, this length of cell phone use and, and how avidly has been used. We all have cell phones. But for how many years each of us has been using this phone and how avidly each of us is using this cell phone? This affects also this, what we later see in population statistics. And cancer statistics are too general because often you go to website and then you see brain cancer in Australia, bzzz, flat line. But when you start to dissect, and this has been done in the US, when you start to dissect Brain cancer is not single disease. So let's look just glioma. And let's split this population into different age brackets. So when you start, so people, for example, who started earliest, and they are using the most, 40, 50 years old, then appears to be some sort of increase in developing brain cancer. So depending how you look at the statistics, if you put everything together, you see nothing much, but when you begin to dissect different types of cancer and subsections of age groups within population that, really, that were really using the cell phone much, 
then you might see something. And finally, what is causing this cancer? Epidemiology doesn't tell. Epidemiology says only that when you are using very much your cell phone, your risk of developing glioma increases. It doesn't say that this radiation is causing disease. And I have written an article in, in the conversation, which is very popular here in, in Australia. Th this was in conversation in United Kingdom published. That there is this sort of thing that case control studies show that there is increased risk of brain cancer, but maybe not because this radiation causes brain cancer, but maybe this radiation accelerates development of cancer caused by something else. So meaning it works as sort of co-carcinogen. So when you are exposed to some chemicals or gamma radiation, you, your brain cancer might be triggered. Then you use a lot of cell phone, and this cell phone radiation might help to faster manifest this brain cancer. And this might be coming, this, this support for this information from animal studies, where animals were exposed to cell phone radiation and carcinogens, chemicals, or radiation that were at the doses that don't really cause yet cancer. When they were mixed with radiation from cell phones, animals were getting cancer. So there might be co-carcinogenic effect of cell phone radiation. When you are thinking about human studies, so meaning this, besides epidemiology, this is what we should be most interested. Mo vast majority are so-called feeling studies. You ask. Some people say that they are sensitive to radiation. So scientists have done studies bringing those people to lab and asking them how do they feel when they are being exposed or non-exposed. Do they recognize when the radiation is on or off? This type of studies can be done, of course, as a first resort to, to figure out something. But if they don't bring any results, then we don't know really much because those symptoms, what people who s claim that they are sensitive, are very non-specific symptoms. They are similar like in many allergies, you get this kind of symptoms, or symptoms that can be caused by simply um, situational stress. You are, you are worried or you are afraid or you're nervous about something. You may get the same kind of symptoms. And therefore, person who has, who thinks, that is sensitive to this radiation. When this person comes to lab and allows to be irradiated and participates in experiment, this person thinks in own mind that this is harmful, that person is sacrificing for science, and therefore is worried and may get symptoms, then one should not, and you, you cannot dissect between those symptoms caused by regular stress of experiment with these symptoms which would be eventually caused by, by exposure to, to radiation. And this what we need, uh, we have a lack of studies, sorry, again, a lack of studies that would be examining how human physiology reacts. So expose people, take samples, don't ask how do you feel, compare molecules here, molecules there, what has happened. But these studies are not being performed. We tried, but we were cut off. Uh, now about sensitivity to EMF, of course, one can think uh, common sense tells, yes, it is existing. There is such a thing. Why common sense says so? Because anything you, what you can imagine in our environment is chemicals, radiation, pollen, whatever. To everything, we have more sensitive subpopulation of humans. Some people are sensitive to pollen, not everybody. Some people are more sensitive to UV than others, and so on. Why this type of radiation would be the only one that there would be no sensitive group, subgroup of people? We only don't know what is this radiation level that they are reacting or not reacting. 
And of course, <coughs> problem here is that this research has been done on the sensitivity to, to EMF by psychologists. So they are tending to ask people to come to lab, expose them, ask them how they feel. They are psychologists. They, they don't do physiology. How can you find out whether there is any physiological ailment by using only psychology methods? You cannot. And therefore, this is the problem. Of course, otherwise, there is small sample sizes. Those psychologists are used to this, that they are doing experiments on, on small group of people. 20, 30 persons they invite and ask what is happening. This is very small sample. Then also, when they are inviting people to participate in studies, they say, we were asking sensitive people to come forward, participate. They couldn't perform correctly in experiments. We have proven that there is no such a thing. But starting point is, they ask sensitive people to come, but they are self-diagnosed sensitive people. How many of those people are really EMF sensitive? And how many are thinking that they are sensitive, but something else is causing their health problem? They don't know it. So therefore, if they invite, for example, 30 people, they don't know whether 29 are sensitive to this radiation or 29 are not sensitive, and only one is. And then is coming out the result. Nobody knows. Apparently, no, no effect. Then we have animal studies, because of course not everything we can do on humans. But there is one problem. This is what we are usually doing with animal studies. We do toxicology, and we expose animals to high overdose of agent that we are studying, chemical or radiation. This kind of overdose that human being will never be exposed in normal life. But we are looking, if animal exposed to this amount of agent develops health problems, then we are thinking maybe humans are also in some sort of problem. We should look more closely. But this kind of classical toxicology is not possible because it is overdosing this radiation is overdosing microwaves. In extreme situation, you can make a joke, you could cook your animals because it is like microwave oven, warming up. Therefore, we cannot do experiments where we highly overdose this radiation because they would cause heating of animal and we don't see anything. Therefore, another thing is, another kind of toxicology where we expose animals for their whole lifetime or even still when they are in mother's womb, we expose them to this radiation, but the radiation levels that are similar to this what our cell phones are emitting to this what we humans are exposed. In this situation, if animals are responding and there is some effect, we can think, all right, humans might be affected. But when there is no effect whatsoever, we don't know anything about humans because, however, mouse or rat is not exactly human. And therefore, it might be so that while mice and rats will not respond, human may respond. So, this kind of lifetime exposures to low dose radiation, similar to exposure of, of humans, if it's negative, no any effect observed, it doesn't tell us anything. It, but often it is used to, to say that we expose them for a lifetime, nothing happens, so everything is fine, we people are safe. This is misleading or simply lying. But then there are those co-carcinogen studies that I mentioned earlier that some of them show effects. So many, but there were only half a dozen of these studies performed, very few. And therefore, this kind of co-carcinogen studies are needed because on one hand, we are talking about cell phone radiation, which is very weak stimulus that maybe alone it is unable to do something. But if co-carcinogen studies in animals show some effects, so maybe it is co-carcinogen. But this type of research has not been done at all. 
nothing, no studies, just those few animal studies. Then of course there is this talk about mechanism, how things could be happening in what this radiation is causing in cells, living cells, and we can observe effects. This is just a sort of graph of different proteins that are involved in so-called stress response in cells. Not important right now, those green boxes. Stress response in cells, it is very preserved property of every cell that they have a mechanism to defend themselves against some harm that could come from environment. So once radiation or chemicals are coming to cell and cell recognizes that this is harmful, mm -hmm. then it triggers a response, produces new proteins inside the cell that are protecting, doing different things to protect the cell. So if we are thinking that cell phone radiation causes any effects, the first thing what we should be observing is stress response, that cells are being affected and they are be defending themselves. And here are a few studies that examined not single but several stress proteins inside different cells. All these studies were done in different laboratories using different biological models, using different types of setting how they, those biological models were exposed, and all arrived at the same. Several certain proteins were being activated by this radiation. Different cells, different experimental conditions, but they were arriving at the same things. Few proteins were in all of them affected. And what this effect on these proteins can do, it can affect how our genes are being regulated in cells, how our uh, um, carcinogenicity can be, can be affected. So, mechanism is still unclear, but problem is this replication of results and how robust mm -hmm. those results are. It is often very problematic in this research area to replicate uh, studies done in other laboratories and get them uh, enough strong results that it is not result maybe yes, maybe not, but yes or no. It's kind of difficult. But what it appears a couple of years ago, two guys, Schmidt and Kuster. Kuster is very famous for dosimetry in this area, so meaning how to measure radiation exposures, how to design different equipment for performing correct experiments. So he is sort of guru in this, exp in this area of, of radiation and exposing to this radiation. They made theoretical study and they found out that these radiation exposures, what we are using and were using for tens of years in our in vitro laboratory studies are too little, that we were using exposures at the maximum, this kind of how much radiation is emitted by cell phone at the most, so-called two watts per kilogram, this kind of unit. But they say cells in our body, when we put cell phone to our body, muscles or skin cells, they feel up to 40 watts per kilogram. So this is very different exposure. We have done in my lab some experiments with higher exposures, with 10 watts per kilogram. Results were really nicely robust, but we were criticized that this is too high exposure. But when you have this kind of higher exposure and control temperature that we are not cooking your cells, then you get really robust results. And it means that why we have this problem of, of mechanism, it have a problem because we have unrealistic exposures. We are not exposing enough our cells. Our cells in our body are exposed to much more radiation than this radiation what we used in experiments. And therefore, all these studies that have been done to date and were showing something should be repeated with new exposure levels 
to find out whether what's really what's really happening. Now, <coughs> of course, when we have this information from epidemiology, from animal studies, little bit from from uh, in vitro studies, showing that there is some possible risk of developing health problems, brain cancer, or maybe something else. There is, of course, talk about some precautions, and here is about precautionary principle. This is this European Union document, fairly vague, few pages of text about what to do when we don't know what to do, how to take precautions. And here is a quote from this, from this text. Ah, when, when to, what are conditions for invoking precautionary principle? And of course, then it is when we have scientific information is insufficient, inconclusive, or uncertain, and when we have suspicions that there can be real health effect dangerous for people, and when we are thinking this way that this our protection is insufficient to, to really protect human population. So in this kind of cases, when we have those three different kinds of suspicious uh, uh, thoughts, we can invoke precautionary principle. And when we look, dissect all this, that information is insufficient, inconclusive, or uncertain, this is precisely why IARC classified cell phone radiation as a possible carcinogen. Nothing more, nothing less. Because information is insufficient, inconclusive, or uncertain. There is information indicating some, some effects, but, and so on. Then there are indications that the possible effects on human health might be potentially dangerous. Well, brain cancer, for example, is dangerous. So we have this second case also correctly. And then we have this that whatever we do is inconsistent with the chosen level of protection. We have this chosen level of protection, namely whenever we Okay, there is a safety limit which says how much radiation can be emitted by cell phone. And this level of radiation should not cause us any health problems. This is safety limit. But epidemiological studies have been done in population of people like us who have cell phones, we purchase them in shop, and we are using them for years and years and years, meaning those phones are in compliance with current safety limits. They fulfill them. But when you have this kind of so-called safe phone, which is in compliance with safety limits, when you use it avidly for 10 years, your risk of developing brain cancer increases. So logically, it means that the safety limits that are being used in developing of this in this cell phone are insufficient to protect your health. Because when you use for a long period of time this so-called safe phone, you can increase your risk of developing glioma. So all these three conditions or preconditions for invoking precautionary principle are here. They are fu fulfilled. But there is, of course, uh, a lot of un un unwillingness to, to do it. And first of all, implementing precautionary principle doesn't mean stopping your cell phones or blocking it or whatever, going back in time. That's not this. It's not prevention. But there is very strong opposition, especially from telecom industry, because precautionary principle document contains several things like industry would need to prove that their product is safe. So it would be not this way like Food and Drug Administration gave a exemption because there is low power emissions, but industry would need to prove that it is safe piece of equipment. They would need to do research or fund this research and independently and so on. So it would cost a lot of money. But of course also there would be possible to Requ uh, require that make more efficient technology, technology that emits less radiation in order to get 
all this communication. And of course, there would be possible to limit this un completely uncontrolled spread of this um, technology anywhere and everywhere if gadget is fulfilling safety limits set by International Commission for non ionizing Radiation Protection, then it is safe, what is not necessarily so. And this kind of gadget can be installed anywhere and nobody cares. So those, when you live in some area, you open your, on your cell phone, your Wi-Fi connection, <coughs> very, very many Wi-Fi networks, many, many. In your living apartment building, very many. So, so this is something what is completely without any control because it is no problem, but not necessarily. And then, of course, one can think this way that implementation of precautionary principle will create new knowledge because we need to do new research on biomedical uh, uh, effects and we need to make new research in technology to develop more efficient technology. So this will create new knowledge. But at the same time, it will also create new jobs in research, for example. There will be shift of jobs from one area to another, but one company will lose because we'll have less jobs, but another company will gain. So there is not this kind of thing that suddenly jobs will ex uh, expire, finish, no. Precautionary principle will not lead to this. It will be shift of this uh, uh, jobs between different industries. Then, of course, one thing is this uh, classification, what was done in 2011, which was saying that there is possible carcinogen, this cell phone radiation. I think right now, after 2011, several studies that have been done clearly help to uh, uh, think that this current evidence rather says it could be classified as 2A, as probable carcinogen in, in, with current knowledge. And here it is. These epidemiological studies, we have these three case control studies now, Interfon, Hardell, Serenat, showing increasing uh, risk of developing brain cancer. We have interphone studies showing correlation of location of tumor in most exposed area of brain. We have animal studies, we have co-carcinogenicity studies, which were available then in 2011. We have new co-carcinogenicity study in 2015, which has been uh, uh, published. And then finally, is National Toxicology Program, which is most stringent way of doing toxicological experiments, uh, they have shown that rats exposed for lifetime to cell phone radiation are developing glioma. And also, of course, this dosimetry information that all this what we were doing in vitro in laboratory, we were doing wrongly. We didn't use enough radiation to expose our cells. And that's why those results from in vitro are so ambiguous. So we have some, or let's say plenty of gaps in the research here, just a few examples. So first of all, we need epidemiology with realistic radiation exposure data. This that we don't uh, count minutes, but we have really how much radiation person got. And it is possible. There are cell phone apps that can be installed on cell phones and they will measure around the clock, year around, all radiation that you were exposed to, download it to cloud, and 10 years later, scientists can use it. There are some. Then, of course, the search for sensitive subpopulations should be using, be done using biochemistry methods. Important thing is finding whether DNA is damaged by this radiation or not. There is a lot of talk about this damage of DNA, but we don't know, is it DNA damage? Or is it so that in our cells is continuously happening spontaneous DNA damage, and the cell phone radiation might be impairing processes of repairing this damage. 
So this what spontaneously gets damaged, it is being repaired in our cells, that's why we don't get cancer. But we don't know this. And what is most important, this DNA damage was observed in vitro in laboratories and also in some animal studies. Nobody has shown this kind of effect in humans, in living person. Exposed person, take a samples, even, for example, swab from mouth, and see whether DNA is damaged or not. Nobody has done so far. Then is, of course, one, in, oh, sorry, one important thing, where I'm going, yes, is examining whether human blood-brain barrier is being affected. This is one important thing. Examining co-carcinogenic co -carcinogenic effects of cell phone radiation, as was mentioned earlier, and this what was mentioned earlier, is chronic effects, long term, long term. But then 5G is coming. 5G is nothing, something completely so new, because 5G will incorporate 3 and 4G, which is already existing, and add on, add on top of it, this what is with so-called microwave uh, uh, radiation will be added. So meaning this what, what we have this 1, 2, 3, 4, so meaning this 3 and 4G, which is now, it will be incorporated into 5G. And there are some novelties which 5G technology will bring. Of course, this is why it is happening, because there was a lot of empty spectrum, and this spectrum what has been used so far, this electromagnetic spectrum was getting so full that it was not possible to add more. And also this empty spectrum, especially this close to, to uh, 300 gigahertz, it has this property that it, you can transmit in very short time very much of information. So meaning you can download your movie in a matter of seconds. So what people like, and it's ready. So this, this uh, millimeter wave spectrum gives it. But the millimeter waves are very fussy. They don't go through walls of our buildings. They don't go through, through trees. You are in forest, they don't go through. If it is raining, rain is absorbing them. You cannot communicate this way. So you have to figure out how to communicate. And there we are coming to small cells, meaning those cell towers, what we have now, they will be used, but we need small cells, tiny cell, to cell towers everywhere in order to communicate. Because, for example, here, a cell tower in park, there are some trees, those cell phones will not get communication because trees will absorb it. So you need small cells to retransmit signal with some sort of zigzag to get to your phone. So this will be, this what people are concerned, some people are concerned that there will be plenty and plenty of this kind of small cell towers, gadgets on our walls, on lamps, wherever, just to help in communication. And then of course there will be so much of this communication that these old-fashioned cell towers will not be enough. So there will be this uh, so-called MIMO, still multiple input, multiple output. This kind of cell tower will not manage to handle all this communication, what will be needed. So we will need more tower and more massive towers in order to handle all this communication with those millions of small cells. So it will be this quite, quite dramatic change in this what we will see and what will be happening in our environment. And of course, what is the aim? This is here from Australia that we will get this, this communi communities and everything, whatever we, we are doing, will be connected to internet and communicate with each other. So your car will be connected to internet, your dishwasher will be connected to internet, your electric toothbrush will be connected to internet. Everything will be there. And everything will be communicating with each other during this, using this 3G, 4G, and small cells from 5G. 
And of course, when looking at slides, this slide from, from Australia and from AMTA, there is what they need and what should be done, what government should be doing for them and so on, everybody for them. But there is nowhere mentioned health. Nowhere is mentioned that some research on health should be done. And there is very limited biomedical research on this millimeter wave, this new part of, of spectrum that will be used. There are two epidemiological studies done in early 80s. And there are 195 studies, which are vast majority of them completely useless. We don't know what millimeter waves will do. Millimeter waves will do differently than this 4G and 3G radiation. Millimeter waves penetrate only our skin. Everything will be in our skin. So meaning all this radiation will be absorbed by our skin and by our eyes. And we don't know how this radiation affects biologically human skin. But there was a couple of years ago, Nokia and, and University in, in New York, they organized a, a symposium on what millimeter waves can do to, to human body, what we know about biology, and finally was published in, in IEEE, in IEEE Microwave Magazine, this, this sort of research, uh, or a, a review article. But this review article is, is this kind of very funny attitude of scientists. On one hand, they say, everything what is there problematic in this what we know, what we don't know, but they give, in spite of all these problems that are coming up in their article, they give title to this, safe for generations to come. In articles they say, we don't know what is happening, we have very little research, we have very few studies, we need more information because there is some coupling between skin and antennas between eyes and antennas, whatever. We have very little, but title to this article is safe. But when you read the article, it doesn't look so safe. Or at least lack of information to make this kind of final decision. I will skip those couple of, of uh, slides. Uh, all these slides are on my website, so free, free for grabs. And of course, now we have ten can ask this, this deja vu, because with cell phones, 1G through 4G, it was, in 80s, was considered that it is everything is fine, we can market it, no problem, low power. But today, it is considered as possible carcinogen. Again, we have future of 5G and Internet of Things. This again, this is low power technology. When I asked on recently on conference, how about health? Is there any consideration for health effects? Scientists from industry just stood up and said, but this is low power. It will be everything low power. So this is this, this attitude. It will be low power, so. But what future research will show? Because definitely this technology will be deployed will be coming, we'll be doing research post-deployment, interesting what will come out of this. Because of course, right now, even industry doesn't know exactly what this 5G technology will be, which frequencies will be used and where and how and so on. It is everything under development, because for example, how to deploy those small cells in huge railway station where there are crowds of people. And so they are thinking this way, all these tiles on the floor, each will be one antenna. So wherever you are walking, you will have connection. And even this kind of crazy scenarios, what if we Im embed antennas for those cell phones in heels of our shoes? Maxwell Smart is coming. <laughs> life. So even this kind of, they of course say this is everything 
considered and we are figuring out how to make this technology that will work. But there are some crazy scenarios. One can wonder what will happen. But never mind what will happen. As they say, ultra 5, 5G service in five years will be here. So here are a few conclusions from, from this, what I said, and, and uh, I will not repeat them very much, but here is one thing. What is, I think, important is this, that is need for temporary moratorium on 5G and Internet of Things deployment before we learn something more. Because now we have uh, five years before it is deployed, this would be last moment to start large toxicology studies on animals and start cohort studies on humans. But they are not happening. Nobody is bothering about that. And that's why this is very important, to make some temporary moratorium and do some research before we really deploy this everywhere and, and but well I, I guess this will never happen but post deployment we'll do research and we'll see whether there are any effects or not. Thank you. <laughs>